It's our story. Belinda Stradley, Berkeley, California. Well, in the 60s, I uh, became disabled when, it, actually 1969, I was 16 years old and I'd been in a car accident. And it was um, a life-changing event in a lot of ways, but one of the ways that stuck with me the, the, the most deep, deeply is the way that I was treated by the, by the people around me. As soon as I became disabled, it was overnight. Uh, I, was, I had been 16 years old and always got the message that my whole life was in front of me and I had all kinds of options and I could have a good life and I felt like a powerful person. And, and suddenly, because I was in a, a car accident, we were driving and a, a drunk driver hit us head on and the car I was in spun and I was thrown from a, a four-door Studebaker and hit the ground and um, damaged my spinal cord and became a para. But right from the beginning when I was in the hospital, the messages that I got from all the professionals were of one note and that was, oh, your life is not quite over. You'll be, you'll, you'll probably be able to be productive in some way and, co and contribute to society. But beyond that, there was never talk of happiness or fulfillment or having a good life or having relationships or fun. That was over. And over the course of my rehab, and being in the hospital and, and uh, the years that followed, this being in, you know, 70, 71, this message was given me, to me so strongly uh, that when I came to Berkeley and heard a different message, it's made such a tremendous impact on me that I, I still have such a belief in the independent living m concept, independent living movement principles that uh, I'm still drawn to promote that even though the world has changed so dramatically since then, since that time. Discrimination, segregation, well, nothing was accessible then. There was no concept of uh, blue parking spaces or uh, curb cuts. The, the idea was, the reality was that you can get out of your house if you're lucky to be in a place with a ramp or an elevator, but after that, you can't go anywhere because you can't get down the curbs. Well, you can get down driveways, but there, you, you, there's no accessible transportation. When you get someplace, you're not going to be able to get in because there were no ramps anyplace. Restaurants, uh, this was before any kind of codes that would require access, so no place was. No city buildings, government buildings, stores. So, and the, the message that we were given in rehab was, oh, it's a shame that you really won't be able to go anywhere. Yeah, that's, 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 that's how it is. It never occurred to anyone that there was anything wrong with that. It was always our own personal tragedy on an individual basis, not, so, not something that existed in society or that society had any responsibility about that or would want to change that. It just, it just was not on the table in anyone's mind. Uh, so that was that was depressing. It was uh, really a downer for a number of years. But that's the way it was. When I went to college, I went to the big state school in Indiana in Bloomington, and they had discouraged me from coming. Uh, they had really told students with disabilities that they should stay in the regional campuses. And <clears throat> that those campuses, well, if they could go, fine. If not, they couldn't. But the 
big campus of 30,000 students was totally inaccessible. They had not lifted one finger to do anything, and they were quite unhappy that I bothered to come there, and they didn't do anything while I was there in terms of access. The only housing that approached accessibility was the graduate dorm that only had one big step to get into it, but that was the closest they had, so I did live there for a few years, and at that time I uh, used crutches and braces, and they have very severe winters, and I don't know how I managed to not really injure myself. And they would tow my car uh, from places when I would try to get to school, and when I would appeal the, the tickets, they would say, why did you come here? And we're not going to give you a break on your tickets. If you feel like you need to get to class, you better find someone yourself to drive you and drop you off. They were quite hostile to me. And in those days, that's just the way it was. And uh, uh, the counselor I had in my undergraduate program told me that I would have a hard time getting a job and so I should look for a different field. It was speech pathology at that time. And she discouraged me from staying in the program. Well, I stayed in the program. There wasn't anything else I was dying to do, but she harassed me during the whole time I was there and fixed it so that I signed an agreement that I wouldn't continue on in the graduate program. It was just blatant stereotyping discrimination, which would be illegal now. So I did not, however, miss that in the 60s, something was really fabulous going on in Berkeley. The It's Our Story Project is a national effort to make disability history public and accessible. Visit us at www.itsourstory.org or on the It's Our Story Project YouTube channel.